This flight, without saying anything to anyone, just kind of goes <laughs> Normal laws of safety just go out the window and I take his head and just push it down. I just see five guys with machine guns just like shooting in the air. The gunfire starts getting closer, rushing towards us and boom. What are you doing? Love and loss and death all come together. How much am I willing to sacrifice to tell this story? Hey guys, welcome to Bent Planet. This interview dives into the mental chaos of photojournalist faces while working in conflict zones. Patrick Tombola has not only covered some incredible stories, but he's ended up in some brutal life-threatening situations. In this interview, we talk about the time he was kidnapped in Syria, along with a stack of other stories and reflections on how people in his line of work manage their stress levels and operate emotionally through such high-risk situations. Pour yourself a drink, get into your favorite chair. This chat takes some heavy twists and turns. Enjoy. Ready to hear a story? No, oh, mate. Where are you now? Uh, You're in well, uh, Venezia. Like, not many people can yeah. say they've grown up in Venice. <laughs> like, yeah. After 20 years abroad, just decided to head back here one and a half years ago. I, I sort of split my time between some crazy ass places around the world. And then I come back here and it's just like, you know, there's Mario, which is at uh, the uh, the guy that makes me coffee and, you know, he doesn't even know English and he speaks so like that. No, no, no. <laughs> so, this is your coffee. It would and be then, so familiar you know, and, and like feel like home to you, wouldn't it? Just be amazing. To come yeah. And then there's like, you know, Giovanni, which is like the, you know, the, the, the fisherman. And there's like Marina, which is like the shopkeeper. I know them all and they know my dog. And so, you know, it's so cool. And then I take a flight and then I'm like, in Afghanistan, just like with the Taliban's just going, I love and I'm like, I was with Marina and Mario about <laughs> seven hours ago talking about tides and, and you know, and like, uh, you know, is it going to rain or is it not? Oh, it's cold today. Oh, jolly good. You know, it's just yeah. like super local. And then you just go super international, but local are the, for local for them. You know what I mean? Like, when yeah, you're with and the you Taliban, exactly, they don't fit international. You weren't exactly jumping into like other tourist places where people had a relaxed, chilled out nature where they wanted to meet new people and just converse about things that were going on. Oh, mate, you were just jumping into the most hardcore places where all your focus had to be on learning what the hell was going on on the ground in that moment. And everyone you're associating with only care about what's yeah. going on on the ground in that moment. Pretty. Well, look, I mean, just 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 as a little window into into my reality, like one day, like the, my first assignment, uh, you know, self-taken assignment to Libya. I mean, I um, had started photography a year before and um, then the Libyan war started and I was like, I, I don't have any I don't have much money. I don't have much experience. No, no, I don't even know how to get there. It sounds all too complicated. And then I read this thing where. I heard that from Malta, there was some flights, UN flights going out. Um, and I was like, oh, that sounds reasonable. I took a low, a cheap flight, like a seven euro flight from Venice to Malta. I ended up at the front of the UN um, uh, place there the day after. I met a couple of people. I said, oh, why don't we go and have a beer? They gave me the insight on how to get on these flights. And then I got my my best friend at the time who's unfortunately now dead but um he basically photoshopped a paper that looked very serious and that i was a great photojournalist and i, I submitted that <laughs> and 24 hours later i was in a small little flight that was like going from malta all the way to libya and because the war like there was a war there was like just probably only about a couple of k's around the airport that was like uh, that we were able to kind of, uh, you know, actually uh, safe sort of land, zone. you know, safe flight zone. So a normal flight just starts going like, you know, a couple of two or three Ks back, to a forward like that, and just slowly descend. This flight just out of nowhere, without saying anything to anyone, just kind of goes <laughs> like that. And it <laughs> oh, literally God. just like went, like I just went from talking to just a random guy to just kind of going... <laughs> I strapped to this thing and uh, everyone was like, what is happening? Holy and uh, yeah, the, the 
the captain just forgot to tell us <laughs> what the what the four one one was, and I thought I was going to die. I thought, but who we were you avoiding missiles? Who were you yeah. working for? You got, you got in on that job as a freelance, and you like you convinced them you were working for someone in particular, or you were working for someone, yeah. or yeah, with a for a photographic agency that I didn't have and. That I didn't know. So they had strict rules on who could get into Libya, and you and your mate just bluffed it. And can we use yeah. the word forged? <laughs> yeah. Oh no 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 no. Forged is absolutely the right way. To, right. To so you forged that, that's documents exactly. to make it look like you're a professional yeah. photographer, and the, and they were documents yeah. that need that were necessary for people to allow you onto that flight into Libya. Yeah. 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 That there was no way that without it I could have gone on that flight. So that, that was, was the first, only. That was your first major assignment as a photojournalist. Yeah. You bluffed your yeah. way into a war zone. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> since then I realized that bluffing your way into things is basically a survival instinct. I mean, without bluffing your way into anything, you know, you, you might be in front of a um, of a crowd. Like many years later, I was in Egypt, and uh, there's a crowd of about mm, ten to twelve. Uh, Egyptians, uh, some of them with machetes that uh, basically just came up to me and just said, we know you're a Jewish spy and uh, and uh, now we're going to kill you. And I was like, okay, uh, Jewish spy, me? No. <laughs> so I had to bluff my way into basically just reciting this ridiculous part of an Italian stereotype. I was like, I am not a Jewish spy. I am Italian because uh, I have a pizza, a spaghetti. I I do football. Uh. And then I started talking about all these football players that I heard when I was young. It's like, ah, Totti, uh, um, uh, Baggio. Uh, I won the World Cup in 2006. Uh, it's great. Oh uh, Italy. Because everyone loves, you know, a funny Italian. And I was like, okay, this is just my way. Just like to get out of it so it's not that i was lying because i'm italian but obviously i'm not that kind of italian <clears throat> and there was no way i could have just gone ah uh, guys i think that um you know you're quite politically incorrect here and culturally inappropriate like i'm not jewish even though i have a big nose <laughs> you know all of that just wasn't gonna cut it so i realized that, okay sometimes laughing your way out of it has probably saved me um a fair bit <laughs> Wow, yeah, there's a fine line well. with that though, right? Because like, sorry, my camera keeps going all whacked out. Um, there's a fine line with like bluffing your way into something to get to the next stage and like to further your career. Like I've done it loads in my life. Yeah. Like gotten got in, into a new level of my of a career in the past through bluffing. Because you always say, yeah, of course I can do that. Of course I can do that. So you can get to the next level. And then there's bluffing like you just talked about where you're bluffing your way out of a right. life and death situation where you have to bluff. And then I, yeah. but I guess also in your, in your field, you've probably come across people that have bluffed too much and that's really fucked you around and like put you in a really dangerous position because they haven't had the skills necessary to cope in a situation that they need them in. And like, like if you, you must have experienced that a lot too, where people are like, Sorry. <laughs> uh, hello, she uh, wants well, to tell part of the story too. <laughs> yeah, she's getting a bit jealous, man. Um, yeah, we're like, you must have experienced that a lot too, I imagine, where like in war zones and, and things like that, where someone's there that you're, you're just thinking, come on, man, you, you shouldn't be bluffing at this moment. You know, you're putting us all in yeah. jeopardy. Absolutely. Look, and, uh, and war zones are a funny a funny uh, place in the sense, in a journalistic sense, because, um, you know, w w when I bluffed my way into Syria, uh, uh, in Libya, I was, uh, I was exactly 30. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the youngest spring chicken, uh, but I saw 20, 21, 22 year old guys that were just all gung ho and they saw war as um, you know, as a way to further their career because you know that's that, that's quite inevitable. It, it, you know, war does provide some incredible visuals of extreme contradiction, 
um, conflict, uh, emotion, you know, everything is heightened to the absolute max, you know, mm. loss is extreme loss. Love in an impossible place like war is, is love to the nth degree. You know, I was, uh, I documented a wedding between two hospital workers in one of the hospitals in Aleppo in Syria. And, you know, you could hear the sound of bombs in the background and they were just like, you know, on the shoulders of their friends celebrating their wedding. And that, oh, you know, man, it, it wasn't just a wedding. That. Well. Or, you know, or I was in another place in Syria where, uh, you know, because it was being bombed by, by planes, you know, there could be no lights at night. And they celebrated the wedding and there will be like, you know, a man with a light, uh, a wall, all the people celebrating at the back and the two, um, you know, groom and, and, um, and bride, and bride the, it, at the front. And there will be like three, two, one light. And then everyone by like, bing, 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 photo, photo, photo. The light will last like three seconds and then boom, dark. Because you wow. couldn't have, and then they would move to another location and do the same, you know. And, you know, the, 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 those were intense moments where love and loss and death, you know, they all come together and they create this sort of, you know, incredibly powerful mix of, uh, of anything that we experience in life that completely compressed. And so for a photographer, it's, um, it's a very, it, it's a, you know, it, it, it's a super interesting place to be. However, if you're extremely young, you might not realize what you're getting yourself into. You might not be able to assess risk. You might be too, um, too callous with some of the people you photograph because, you know, you want to extract and while you also need to, uh, you know, realize that you need to give respect to the people that are opening themselves, you know, in terms of their pain and everything to you. Uh, you need to know how to talk to people and you need to know how, what is danger what's worth you know if there is an incredible story and it's very dangerous then you need to start thinking okay well how much am i willing to sacrifice to tell this story and is this story worth it and in some instances it isn't the risk is just too great and um and you're not adding anything to the story so i mean i i, I do remember this story in syria where you know, someone else's um, um, ambition almost got me killed. And that was probably one of the scariest moments of my career so far. Yeah, well, and I'm sure you've um, had a few. So what happened there exactly? That was, uh, yeah. it was someone you were working with or they were, they were supposed to be working with you or you were just... No, I was, I was an assignment or? for a... I was on assignment for a German magazine and uh, we were based in a, um, with a bunch of army people from the Frisian army. So we were staying at their, um, you know, at the headqu uh, headquarters. So just, just to, who exactly, is, who exactly is that? And what's like, are you able to give like a quick wrap on the situation, like the political climate okay. of the war in that moment? So that sort of get an idea of who's who. Sure. Uh, so it was um, actually a couple of days before Christmas 2012. I had been in Syria, in northern Syria, a place called Aleppo, which is one of the main uh, uh, sort of uh, economic hubs, or it used to be main economic hubs of, uh, um, of northern Syria. And um, previously, about mm, in July, August that year, um until then it had been in the hands of the uh of the syrian army so the army under the control of uh, bashar al-assad who <clears throat> has been a dictator a ruthless dictator uh you know for i don't know uh, more than a decade and before that his father was uh a dictator his name was hafez uh, Assad and um, you know he the father did not hesitate to uh, completely bomb a city out of existence killing you know tens of thousands of people because they decided to rebel against his iron fist so you know we're talking about you know ruthless dictators that uh, are going to put their political ambitions and political power 
ahead of any sort of calculation in terms of human cost. So that is the, the, the political uh, scenario. The, uh, at the time, it was quite a complex situation because whilst in uh, August, uh, there was just the one free Syrian army. So, you know, once you're fighting against a, a regular army, everyone is like, uh, you know, happy go, you know, we're all friends, we're all against, you know, this ruthless dictator. Uh, yeah, 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 we're all together. Over time, usually within armies that are not very um, structured, there are competition of interests. So, you know, some that are more religious than others, some that are in it for the money and some in it for the political uh, um, and ambitions, some that are more, um, you know, uh, sort of that have uh, these great dreams of uh, political liberation and some that are just like trying to extort some political concession. So uh, over time, there's a lot of different uh, political interests coming up. And uh, at that time in, in December 2012, there was already a fair amount of uh, international jihadis basically uh, arriving in, in Syria from all over Europe. I, I, I remember being on flights uh, Turkish airline flights because what you do you go from every single city within Europe into Istanbul and then from Istanbul take a flight to southern Turkey and then from southern Turkey you take a taxi to the town along the border and then from there you walked across the border and then you would meet your fixer and then from there, catch another taxi to Aleppo that was about two hours. Yeah, and a fixer is someone that you've got on the ground in the, to local yeah. person in the area who is helping you exactly. to establish anything you need to it's get. It's like a local producer of sorts. You know, someone yeah. that, you know, has phone numbers, uh, contacts, addresses. You tell them, I want to do this story. He goes, okay, you can talk to X, Y, Z, and then looks after your mm. security as well, which is yeah. uh, crucial. Uh, he know he speaks the local language, so he's other people talking perhaps about you behind your back, you know, because mm. that happens quite Super a lot. Important. And um, it, you know, crucial, crucial person. So um, you noticing jihadis coming into into well, Syria I mean, through that through that. It was things. crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Now I, we would stay at the same, the cheapest hotel <laughs> in this town um, called Killis, uh, K I L I S. I it's a kill list and i was like Geez, no i know i know it sounds very stuff. weird but it's yeah. uh, it's called killis k-i-l-i-s and um so you know like i would you know we would all be downstairs at this you know dodgy hotel and you know you, you'd get these you know you'd see these like two massive massive black guys or like uh middle eastern looking or you know but you know quite big you know in their trainers you know, saying, you know, I like oh, Akbar. And then, how you going, mate? Oh, uh, yeah, it's not Maccas around here. Yeah, it's not like, like obviously from Cockney like you know, Manchester or like full on Cockney accent, but then, yeah. you know, throwing a couple of Allah Akbar, which is my, God is great, which yeah. is um, a real, I mean, a lot of people think that that is just jihadis that say it, but it's not true. I mean, Allah Akbar is like a call. Um, an Arabic call that says mm. God is great. You know, we are doing it on behalf of God, and it's really like a—I uh, mean, it's almost like a Greek Americans so. or like the the West is really scared of of this Allah Akbar. But you know, Allah Akbar is also a prayer. You know, when people mm. go and pray at the mosque, they say God is great all the time. Yeah, it's like a, it's time, like a know? Western person just saying, "All right, God bless." exactly exactly but the problem is that they also use it at war mm. you know like wh when they shoot a massive bazooka and they hit something it's like everyone goes Allah Akbar. you know mm. in the west we don't really say god bless yeah, sure. <laughs> it's not really that common so because you know, of that, amongst, it, gets, amongst it, it gets you know it's always a situation like that where that's what you hear about that's the moment you always hear about so people then just yeah. obviously assume that that phrase is specific to a death cry i guess exactly mm. against the west but it's not so you, you 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 start being more sensitive to these kind of like mm, phrases words when they're used and you know i could tell that these guys were like 
saying it in a way where they it wasn't just thrown around you know in a very friendly manner it was more like you know there was sort of um i don't know i don't know how to say it. almost like part of this group and and kind of like it, it was a belonging it was it was a sense of belonging like okay we're here because god is great god is great so we will go to syria tomorrow it was really like a mantra it wasn't just a you know cultural a cultural say so anyway, these guys were coming in to fight against assad to help help people fight yes. against him yeah well you know by then the uh, anti assad front had already you know splintered and fractured you know there already been you know a serious competition uh, in the control of the territory because controlling the territory is also about putting taxes on the goods and services on that territory. I mean, you know, as soon as the Assad withdrew, basically someone else was able to put taxes, you know? So, you know, every man and his dog that had any business had to pay a small percentage to that group. Mm. And you attract fighters to your group by paying them a wage. Hence, the more land you control, the more taxes you leave, the more people, um, you pay, the more fighters, the more you, people get. The more fighters you get, the more weapons you get, and the more powerful you are. Hmm. But in terms of these foreign fighter groups, uh, the, the precursor to ISIS was called Jabhat al-Nusra, which is, uh, it's sort of like a, uh, an Islamist group that was fairly extreme and that used that black flag that everyone was so scared about but was not into necessarily kidnapping westerners murdering torturing and you know it didn't have the same propaganda it was much more um it was already international in flavor so it attracted people from uh, jordan people from a lot of tunisians a lot of northern northern africans and people from you know caucus uh, you know from from other regions like that they were all but it just didn't have the same um, emphasis in trying to basically kill anything and anyone that didn't believe in what they believed um they weren't just a bunch of uh go happy guys that you'd meet at you know <laughs> brunch on sunday but uh but, you know, uh, we, we would also share a part of the media center. So going back to the original story, I was in this, uh, you know, with a writer from the magazine that I was working with, a German magazine. And um, there was no internet where these soldiers from the Syri Syri Free Syrian Army were. So I said to the writer, look, I need to, you know, check in because safety wise, you know, once a day, I always have someone outside of Syria that I would check in with. I would say, okay, by nightfall, I'll send you a message saying that I'm okay. And that way, you know, if I don't check in for one day, we decided that, you know, he would start calling a certain amount of people by 48 hours each year. By 72 hours, he actually calls the consulate and start, you know, the whole process of me having disappeared. Yep. So that's quite often in war zones what you try and do just because otherwise you can just disappear. No one really uh, gets, you know, their shit together to actually uh, do something about it. And the longer you disappear for, the harder it is to do something about it. So the first 48 to 72 hours are crucial in getting back someone. After that, you know, God knows where you can be. So yeah, anyway, I'm with my fixer in a car uh, and I'm just driving down. I, I'm, I turn right from a small alley into a main street that has, that is kind of like split, you know, it has a, a big path in the middle and one, you know, one road here, one road here and just, you know, we're sort of going straight here. And I just noticed, like, I, I look, I look to my right. I'm on the front seat. I look to my right, and my fixer's driving, and I kind of see a Westerner with, you know, with a camera. And I'm like, you know, and and by then I knew that some kidnappings that happened. You know, some journalists had already been kidnapped, and 
you know, it, it was a bit sketchy. So I, I used to wear like, a, I'm, I'm obviously blonde. I used to wear like a hat pulled down and a scarf up here. You know, I'd have my cameras in my bag all the time. I try, I mean, I dress pretty daggy, so I'd kind of fit with the local crowd anyway. Um, but, but uh, you know, I'd try and blend in as much as I could. And this guy was just like going short sleeves, you know, because, you know, no, it wasn't short sleeves, but it was enough to show some white skin. Oh, man. Um, and, you know, cameras just Clearly like talking not to bluffing. people as if, you know, was, no, just like looking like he was just at some random, you know, Middle Eastern uh, uh, sort of market bargaining for some uh, <laughs> pipes and, and some lamps. And I was like, dude, what are you doing there? Just jump in the goddamn car. Oh, so you did. And, you, you, know, him, you, you stopped and spoke to him. Yeah, yeah. So I, I knew his fixer because I worked with him and he was a shit fixer, a, a guy that was just like, he'll do anything for money. Like, $100, do you want to take me there? Yeah, okay. Just no idea of safety or anything. And, you know, I was like, dude, just get in straight away. It's not safe. What are you doing? This guy, oh, hello. And I could tell that he, he, he could speak Arabic really well. And in my head, you know, someone that speaks Arabic really well has some field experience. And um, so I was kind of like, you know, I wouldn't let anyone just come in my car because that puts me in danger. But because he spoke such good Arabic, I was like, okay, who knows? Maybe he got a bit lost and, but, you know, he must have some field experience. So he knows what's going on. Blah, blah. Got him into my car, start driving literally within 30 seconds. We just see these massive uh, gunfires just like, bam, 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 coming closer and closer. And I, you know, I just see basically 300 meters, uh, you know, in front of us on the other side of the road, these like six, seven, eight, they're just pulling in like pickup trucks, like full of guys, just like shooting AKs in the air. Jeez. And, um, and I go, okay, uh, that's not good. Whatever it is, it's not good. Cause the, you know, most, most good groups would not behave like that. Most groups that know what they're doing now they're just you know, they obviously are a group of loose cannons that just just did something quite adrenalinic and they're just like you know just trying to find the next thing and i just take the head of this guy because i put both fixes at the front of the car and we're both you know in the back seat and i take his head and just push it down just so the you know guys from the other side can't see us and i just say to the driver just Keep going, normal speed, just like pretend like nothing. You're just two steering guys in a car. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Boom. And they're just kind of like, you know, I can kind of hear the cars coming, 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 coming. And all of a sudden, I just hear this like, ee, ee, ee. and I can see the, you know, the, the, uh, the other journalist is just pulling down the window and it, I just don't understand. I'm thinking like, okay, he's doing it because he wants to hear the, gunfire better you know ta -da. and then i see his arm just pick up this camera massive camera with a battery pack you know you couldn't miss it and just stick it out the window and just oh go like that like you know high sequence photos and i just start screaming him what are you doing and basically it takes about a second before i hear like these car tires screech and then just like the pickup three pickup trucks just jump on the on the footpath that uh, you know divides us and just come rushing towards us and and you know the gunfire starts getting closer he you know pulls back he obviously realizes you know the big fuck up and uh and before we know it you know they are in front of us and i don't know how many guys by then i obviously raised my head because they they saw us and I just see five so guys with machine guns just like shooting in the air right in front of us with eyes about this, you know, this big. Because a lot of these groups, before they go to war, they use methamphetamine. So they are mostly, you know, off the head. Oh, wow. Um, that must add such an element of unpredictable yeah. madness. I mean, I mean, ISIS, ISIS uh, uses methamphetamine. I mean, every single group uses methamphetamines to go to war. You know, it's God, back dude. from the earliest uh, days of war drugs have become a part of warfare 
Um, sure, but to, to, you to need be to like, just to be in that kind of volatile, that level of volatility, yeah. like a, a situation where you've got, I mean, you've got multiple groups. Like, as you said, like you yeah. said, oh, this group sounded like they'd done something a little bit extreme and they were all hyped up. I mean, and the fact that you were like, this group could be any just crazy group that are off, you know, fraction just off there on their own it's not like there's a clear line of like two sides and like no yeah, and then a middle line where you're fighting and anywhere behind that like if you've just got random dudes rocking up all yeah. off their chops on methamphetamine firing machine yeah. guns and you don't even know what their motivation is or which part of oh, the no. and is. one guy and one guy came running from this car with a grenade in his hand. Oh my god! With, with the finger on the little peg, just like, oh my god! Sort of, sort of like running towards us as if he was about to throw it, and he just went like, he didn't detach the pin, but he just sort of like, sort of went like that, almost to throw it in the car, and we were all like, no, 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 no! Oh my and, god! My stomach's dropping out just thinking, oh my god! That's flawed. yeah, and and I was like, okay, if he drops a grenade in the car, well, dead. I mean, it, it also, also because it's not like if I open the car and I run out, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be safe. Because once, usually, what happens is that all you need is a trigger, and then everyone starts shooting. Mm. Like it's not like someone does that and the other guys go, oh no no, what are you doing? That's silly. Let that guy live. Like the other guys would have just gone. Oh, one is out. Like they would have just like, you know, pummeled me. So really all you need is like one guy to lose one second sight of what the reality of the situation is that all hell breaks loose. And then that's it, you know? So anyway, we somehow managed to like convince them not to kill us. And then we get out of the car and they take all our equipment and what, just put us in just the back go, of this. Because that moment, like mm. what's the moment where you convince them not to kill? It's just, you, you just, just that, that sheer seconds of standoff. For some reason, the tipping point doesn't go to them firing at you. And for some reason, they just manage to, to hold off while you're going, please don't shoot, please don't shoot. To be honest, I think what saved me was my blonde hair because oh, wow. I took my hat off and they saw that I was a foreigner. And two things I think played a part in it. It's like, number one, he's a foreigner. He might be useful to us. I mean, a foreigner is like, a, you know, Gold get out of prison free card. And number two is like, he's not, a, he's not necessarily a, a, an enemy in the sense mm. he's not an armed enemy. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, most more likely than not this blonde dude does not have a weapon that can kill us uh so there's no need to kill him instantly uh which doesn't mean that they you know weren't thinking that that was going to happen sooner or later but you know instantly. at least at instantly the moment a nice word. <laughs> instantly. yeah <exactly. laughs> yeah but you know plenty of plenty of occasions for that to happen a little bit down the track uh you know obviously this is against the backdrop of um like I said, quite a lot of journalists being kidnapped. And later in the year, I personally had, um, you know, four to five colleagues of mine that I knew personally that I hung out with, uh, uh, worked with uh, that were kidnapped and then murdered mercilessly on, on the web. So, you know, oh, journalist in um in orange uh jumpsuits you know with a backdrop of you know the syrian desert being brutally murdered and beheaded by you know by isis uh, i didn't know that by then uh I, we we knew that some people had disappeared but we didn't know what um what had happened to them however you know it it doesn't really take a genius, you know. Um, Daniel Pearl, another journalist with the Washington, um, with the Wall Street Journal, had been murdered, um, you know, a long time before, like ten years before. But we knew that in some areas where you know jihadis or extreme Islamist 
were operating, we weren't just running the risk of, uh, you know, of, you know, being being killed by, you know, a bomb, but of something a lot more surgical and sinister, which was people mm. using you for their political purposes, essentially. Mm. Um, I, as an Italian, felt a little bit more protected because Italians, um, Italy is seen always as a sort of a bit of a neutral country. Like, you know, it had the biggest communist uh, party. Outside. It's not US aligned as much, but for British, Australian and American, whew, super scary because those are the most, you know, the, the uh, sort of... Uh, you know, the pro-American are seen as. Mm. But anyway, long story short, um, they get us on the back of this pickup truck and um, and sort of blindfolded on the pickup truck. And, and I can hear something just pointing at my head. And I just kind of go like this a little bit and the, the fold just kind of like falls a bit. And I just, I'm able to see that this guy has a, an AK on my head and, you know, let's remember that this pickup truck is like going in some potholes that are the size of like so a, you're moving you know, now. a pickup truck. You've been, you've been, yeah. So we're moving, we're moving. We're in the back of this truck and you're off driving. Yeah. We're off driving. And, uh, and this guy's got a, an AK on just resting on my head against your skull. Yeah. And, um, the finger on the trigger and oh. I can tell that the, 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 the safety's off. Oh, God. and I just went like, I mean, it, it sounds very silly, but sometimes you can die. You know, you might be in a war zone, uh, in a war zone, and you die of a traffic accident because you know the normal laws of safety just go out the window. Mm. And so you think that you can only die from, a, you know, from a bomb or or torture or whatnot, but you could also die because you know this guy's got a finger on the trigger, a, a pothole that doesn't necessarily you know see and boom just goes off and then just you know next thing you know there's like an omelet of patrick's been on the side of the on the pickup trucks so i was just like trying to kind of like you oh know, obviously we would be in um we've been you know handcuffed at the back so it was like You've not been really able to do anything. yeah i mean that handcuff was like one of the first things that they <laughs> that they do um oh, and just kind of like try and just kind of go like that and every time he'd be like sort of like hitting me with the tip of the of the AK. And so I just, by the end of it, I was just like, okay, well, I suppose I'm just going to have to be for 15 minutes uh, with the, you know, the uh, bullet of an AK about, um, I'm, I mean, if you think about the pressure that you need to exercise on an AK, it's actually not that much. Oh. I mean, you don't you don't have to it really depends on the sensitivity a whole lot of stuff but it really doesn't take much to shoot it uh you know to shoot a weapon it, and you, you don't need like long like that. bouncing along bouncing like along dodgy, for 15 dirty, minutes just hot, like whole road well most of these roads have been bombed oh. you know because they, they'd been you know that they have been like a in a site of uh war for the past six months so you know it's just all bomb 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 all right. and after 15 minutes i'm like no, so 15 minute ride right. that like, must have felt like 24 hours at least i mean that's yeah so i must have just yeah. you think time slows down when you do the plank at the gym <laughs> like that must have been well it, it's kind literally of literally it's really weird because course. in those kind of situations um what well, you know two things happen to me one that you I have a tingly feeling inside me. Like it, it's kind of like a feeling that every sensation is so amplified and so intense that I feel them all at once and none of them at, and none of them at once. It's like, it's just so overwhelming that it, it, I think it's the adrenaline that's rushing through your brain that gives you on the skin this feeling of I'm almost tingling all over. Um, and another one, what I do is complete disconnection. It's like, it's, it is very similar to feel like you are in a movie, but it's, it's not mm. you. It's like, no. it's like step remove. And that has happened over and over in, um, in, in very tough situations, even down the track where, 
you kind of realize that it's your survival instinct kicking in. And um, I don't think it ha that happens to everyone. I think some people might break down. Some people break down later. Some people don't. Uh, I have developed even, I mean, because of my own personal experiences with near-death experiences with my pacemaker. And, you know, so I sort of came at it with a fairly different outlook, I think. One where when emotions just got too much, I have a kill switch. It, they just like, boom, they just switch. And I just don't really feel them anymore, which is good for the moment because you're able to operate uh, you know, unencumbered from intense feelings, but it is very difficult later on because you don't really know where those feelings go and sometimes they become toxic, mm. uh, you know, depression or or anxiety or crippling. Uh, yeah, I imagine you, know, you don't problem. necessarily voluntarily reach down and try and pull those emotions out later because they're such horrific no. feelings. They're such horrific emotions. I mean, you, I guess once you're through the situation and you've passed it, you're like, well, I don't, I don't want to remember that. I don't want to feel that. So I'm not going to reach down and try and resolve it now. I mean, <laughs> once, but sometimes you don't even know that mm. those feelings are there. Like it's not it, it being a very I'm, unconscious. I'm yeah. yeah. <clears throat> being a very unconscious um, uh, sort of mechanism, uh, you automatically just go into survival mode and hence you don't, you don't even know that that is happening. You, you, you realize a long time later when you kind of look back and go like, okay, now I know why, you know, like I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, crippling anxiety, da, da, da. It might have something to do with, uh, you know, with uh, such and such situation. But anyway, to get back to the story, we arrived, uh, you know, in the front of this building. I was already uh, completely blindfolded, so I have no idea where I am. And they get us into this building and uh, up the stairs and into a room. And... Um, Our fixes were put on one couch in one end of the room. There's, it's a very long room. And at the end, there are kind of like these windows, but with, um, with some curtains in the front. So they are put in one corner in the dark at the very end. And me and a guy just get put on these, I suppose, nice couches. And, um, and they tell us, stay there, shut up and don't talk and just stay there so you know off we go uh, you're still blindfolded at this point yeah and uh, still uh, um, still handcuffed. Know, with, uh, handcuffed five minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes half an hour an hour two hours no water no tea no nothing just just like that and, and we couldn't slouch. It was just all about being that. And it's really weird because a million things go through your head. It's like, what if, what about, you know, for the first half an hour, your head just races like, what if they do this? I'll react like that. Okay. Uh, and then you go through your training. You know, I'd already done a fair bit of... Um, a bit of training in hostile, it's called hostile environment training. So, you know, they trained us to know, you know, to, to, to behave in a certain way, kidnapped. Um, so the idea is that you need to remain, um, you need to not do any sudden movements. So everything has to be very slow and clear. Uh, there has to be, well you've just frozen hang on two secs so with respect wait 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 uh, just, one, just one just one moment dude you just froze up okay sorry you just, you just said you have are oh, you you're done you're done uh 
yeah uh, training and you, cool. you and you and you had to be prepared and and yeah got so basically to... the idea is that um w w we did a hostile environment training and in that training, they did a lot of training in um, how to behave if kidnapped. So, you know, a lot of that. And I'd just done about six to eight months before. So it was fairly, it was fairly new and I felt prepared to some extent. Well, wow. And the hostile environment training says never move suddenly. So always keep your hands and your body, uh, you know, visible and clear do things that you know don't behave in a threatening way sudden quick always with respect mm. and essentially treat you know your uh, you know the person in front of you like you want them to treat you so talk to them with respect in a firm way so not like oh please oh oh i would like some food or oh, don't don't beg but just make sure that your needs, you know, that, that you, un, you make them understand that your needs need to be met. Your mm. needs, and there are two main needs, food and safety. Mm. So I don't want to be killed and I don't want to die of, of hunger. And, you know, if you fall ill, I don't, want to, I don't want to die of my illness. So stay alive and stay healthy both mentally and physically, but physically is the main thing because mentally, I mean, it, it's, it, it's the mental part kicks in once the, you know, the, once you're captured for a long time, but, you know, within the first 48, 72 hours, it's like get food, get water and don't die <laughs> essentially. And then the next step is like, well, try and make sure that someone outside, uh, you know, your, you know, the place that you are knows that you're alive, that you're safe. And the and possibly where you are. I mean, that's like the ideal. So all this, is, you know, is just running through my head. It's like, okay, I need to. Uh, I don't have a phone because they took it. Um, you know, um, uh, I need water. Mm, I'm not that thirsty yet. You know, but it's only been two hours. So a lot of these things haven't even. I, I, I you know, it's it's too soon for any of these to like really mean anything because I don't even know who I've got in front of me. <laughs> you know. But, you know, my head is just going, okay, get prepared, do this, do that. Blah, 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 blah. I couldn't talk to the guy. Um, did, and there was a he, mixed feeling. Was he attempting to talk to you or was there any discussion between the two of you? Or were we told not to talk? Yeah, we were told not to talk. Uh, he would try and translate uh, what the guards were saying because <clears> I don't speak Arabic. And he did. So he would try and constantly try and translate like... Just with the kind of, they're just saying the the boss will arrive soon, you know, but just like very very softly. So I know we were waiting for someone important to arrive. So after two hours, this guy, you know, in, you know, sort of robes, uh, you know, uh, sort of Middle Eastern robes comes in and um, sits down in front of us, and he doesn't speak English, so they. Uh, you know, they, they tell my, uh, you know, my colleague to translate, and he's saying, "Don't worry, you're safe. You know, we just need to understand who you are. Uh, you could be spies. You could be dangerous. You could be undermining our revolution. Blah 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 blah." And yeah, in the back of my head, I knew two things: a that um he was trying to reassure us because reassuring your you know your you know the person captured means that those people are going to be more you know compliant cooperative yeah cooperative and number two i knew that it was absolute bullshit <laughs> i knew that you know if they really wanted to identify us they would have you know taken us to the media center uh, because that's, I mean, what reason did a foreigner have to be there? None other than being a journalist. You know, there were no NGO workers, no, no there was nobody other than journalists. So you want to know where we're journalists? You go, you take us to the media center. And he had no intention to do that. Um, 
I do think that looking back at it, he was contacting uh, members of what was soon to be ISIS and try, and he was trying to organize our sale to them. Uh, because what I then discovered is that, um, God. you know, a, a lot of a lot of groups, you know, to make good bucks would kidnap foreigners and sell them to Islamist groups and then, um, you know, make hundreds of thousands of tens of thousands. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so I was kind of reassured, but not really. Um he said a couple of other things. He said, yeah, Look, I guess you know, I guess him uh, trying to the more he tried to reassure you for for reasons you knew was were false. I mean, as soon as you know someone's lying to you about something to try and calm you down, it certainly doesn't calm you down. It, it sort of sends you into the, the headspace that's the opposite of that because you're like, well, what's the opposite of the lie? What's the, you know, if, yeah. if yeah, if the lies if the lie is safety, and I know it's a lie, what's the opposite of that? I can imagine. Exactly. Must, yeah, you must have been just going through the most extreme measures in your head of what could have been taking place. But also, you know, it, think about it. Like us as Westerners, we are not used to. I mean, the only people that can really take away our freedom are public authorities. You know, the cops, mostly. Uh, there is no other situation where we are deprived, unless, you know, it's it's a criminal, in which case that's super scary. But, you know, we don't really, I mean, I've never had an encounter with a criminal to the point that he deprived me of my, of my freedom. So um, us as Westerners, you know, we are not, we're used to being protected. I mean, our, you know, uh, mental the mental outlook on life is like we're gonna get up in the morning i'm gonna do whatever i want all day or you know whatever i want you know outside of commitments but in terms of freedom i can move freely wherever i want to go and my security is not threatened no matter what so that's just like our our headset for that to not be there anymore it defies what we are raised with for most of our lives which is we are you know in charge of our own life and safety and well-being and then all of a sudden that's taken away from someone that does not follow the law does not respect you and has ultimately plans to possibly kill you and there's that sense of disbelief it's like no but that's this is just wrong it's it's impossible you know how how can that happen and it's like the reality is that most of the world knows that that can happen to them anytime i mean outside of the western world you know most people think of people in china think of people in war zones think of people you know activists in russia i mean hell think about you know african african americans in the united states you know they're walking down they get stopped uh, you know, but outside of the United States, in Europe at least, you know, it's very rare for someone to be at the mercy of someone else, you know, the ultimate cause, you know, their, uh, their peril. Um, so it really takes a sort of real mental inner struggle to realize that you are at someone else's mercy. It really, and I remember this thing thinking, no one here is going to save me. I mean, I could die here and no one would be able to do anything about it. And there's that sense of just absolute and total merciless vulnerability, hmm. which is pretty humbling and damn right scary. Um, so all this stuff was going on through my mind and he was talking and I was translating and I was trying to figure out where I was because by then, obviously, they had taken away our um, blindfolds. You know, our blindfolds. And uh, so, you know, bra, 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 he talks and then all of a sudden he leaves. And, and sort of, you know, for the first 10 minutes, you know, everything's good. And then sort of the mood starts changing a little bit and it 
feels like you know the our captors are getting louder and more obnoxious and just like really uh disrespectful in some ways it's like you know looking at us and making fun of us pointing and and just sort of not cool uh and that got me quite worried uh so i was like okay i thought maybe you know the older guy had us protected in a way that he said okay don't touch these guys you know that's too important and um it was nothing of sorts and uh so all of a sudden they get us and uh, how many, how many guys are in, the, in the room with you at that point how many how many guys three there's three three, du- three dudes looking after yeah. you. yeah there's three dudes that are just like between us and our fixes you know our fixes are like uh on the other side of the room, we're here, and there's the three guys. So these is there guys any discussion like, between them and the fixers at that point? I mean, the fixers are local. Are they? Are no, they... no, no, not really. I mean, sure, you know, like they were treated better. Uh, they were giving cigarettes, for example. We were not. Uh, they, they, they had their you know wrists open and removed, and they were just sort of like parked there. Like they knew they so couldn't move. Kind of they were forgiveness. Really... Is it? there's a forgiveness for them just making a buck as opposed to anger at them for working with foreigners? Uh, well, I mean, I think that it really came down to the kind of group that we were with. Mm. You know, I then realized that this group was not an Islamic fundamentalist. It was more a, I mean, it's going a little bit ahead in the story, but it kind of, you know, I'll, I'll just explain it to make sense of what we're, we're seeing here. This was a criminal enterprise. Right. This was basically what we discovered being a criminal group that pretended to be part of the Free Syrian Army that was in reality being paid by the Assad regime in order to do atrocities and make it look like it was a free Syrian army, therefore, you know, trying to destroy that sense of trust between the free Syrian army and the population. And also would then, you know, look for journalists to kidnap and then sell off to ISIS and Islamist groups. Oh, my God. So that's how they made their money. That is not comforting. That's not a good result. So okay, so but, sorry, I sort of skipped you ahead there, but like, but 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 the reason that I said that is because the way they treated the fixes was like they're just a bunch of local guys trying to make money, just like us. They okay. didn't have an overarching ideal of like, oh, you're against God, oh, you are with these foreigners. They didn't give a shit about foreigners. They were just like, we were just like, sign money, sign money, sign money, mm. like that's it. Um. So, yeah, I mean, these three guys take us take us down and then just, like, you know, put us in, in a row and then I can just hear this, this opening door and we're blindfolded and um, and then they just take us to, to this garden. Well, it's not really a garden. It's just, like, an outdoor area, pretty small. And, um, and I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. You know, they're getting us, you know, to the outside, maybe a smoke, maybe. And they just, like, put us on the wall. And I'm like, on the wall okay why was on the wall i don't really need to be on the wall i can just walk around and and i can hear that they're all starting to laugh and i'm like okay they're putting us on a wall and they're starting to laugh uh are they just laughing at us or and then i hear is like shuffle shuffle and then this oh my god and i'm like that sounds like a cocking of, uh, you know, an AK. And it's like, and then I realized that this, like, these two guys, you know, are sort of just standing right in front of us and they've got weapons just like drawn right at us. And, um, and then, you know, the guy says something in Arabic and uh, my colleague just translates and, and it just goes, uh, you said they're not going to kill us. And oh. um, and I was like, my, my first reaction was like, hey, but, but they're not going to be able to make money <laughs> from us if they kill us. You know, we're, we're going to be useless. But it's like, that was kind of a weird thing to, 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 to think of oneself. It's like, well, I'm worth money. 
but that was the first the, 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 the only real thing that I could think about I guess that was just but, a desperate um, grab at a possible scenario that they would keep you alive in your head you were just like sure yeah, yeah absolutely here. absolutely yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and so I'm there, you know, instead of uh, what felt like an hour, but it was probably like 20 seconds. And um, I can hear this guy just like kind of going on a sort of, you know, uh, saying the Arabic numbers like Talata, uh, Harba, uh, I mean, I can't even remember now, but five four three two one and i'm just going like at that oh. moment i basically felt my bowels just like giving up and i did pee myself not not completely but i just i felt like i just couldn't couldn't hold it so i i pissed myself a bit and that was I don't think it was obvious, like, it's not that much, like, you know, ruin my pants or anything, but I, I felt the wetness in my underwear. And it's just almost like this this bottom, like, from here down, it's just I felt this, this complete emptiness. It's just like, and, um, and the, the, the mouth was completely dry. And, um, and, and then I, I had this feeling of, like, I wonder what it's like not to be conscious anymore. I mean, not to be even aware that you exist. And then I'm like, but you don't exist. So how can you be aware of your non-existence? And there was this one second where I had this like huge sort of realization uh, that when you die, you might not actually suffer because you're not even aware of your death. So I sort of felt more sad for the people that were left mm. because they would be aware that I wasn't there anymore. Once you die, you know, who cares? You know, you're, you, you, you don't exist. I mean, you know, in my philosophy at least. And um, so I felt this like wave of compassion for my parents that had, you know, had to lose their only child and uh, for my friends and for anyone that loved me. And, I just I, so, I felt really um, really uh, selfish, having put my career and my want and my my desire to to discover and to find out and to have my career in front of the uh, love that everyone had towards me and the pain that I would have caused. So it was a, a real mixed bag feeling and. Before I knew it, I just heard click. And it didn't record that I didn't hear the bang. I just heard the click. And then I thought, okay. Like for one second, I was like, is this, uh, am I dead? And like, I'm still thinking, therefore, like, I'm not, I'm not in conscious, but I've gone. Like, I just saw, I, I just felt for one second, I thought, okay, maybe I'm, I'm dead, and, but I'm still alive in you know in spirit and therefore uh, you know uh, religious people are right <laughs> and i've been wrong all along oh, and then i kind of look and just, uh, no i'm actually interacting and then i heard them laugh and uh, and i realized the, funny for them. Like, that whole ordeal for me was just five minutes of entertainment for these guys i'm like you oh man Done the pictures. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. And um yeah. And then, and then was, a, was there any I said I said to the other guy, are you okay? And then yeah, he I think he started crying and uh and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And um they took us back inside and they got us to sit. And the adrenaline was just like going on overdrive in my body. Um, and um, yeah, then half an hour later, they freed our fixes. Uh, and weirdly enough, the headquarters of this group was just three streets away from the headquarters of the, of the battalion that I was with. 
that I was embedded with, but out of absolute chance, luck, God knows what, but like the weirdest thing was literally three roads away, even though I'd been captured on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the city. So, you know, another story. You've been captured life. on the other side and, of the city and then brought, and, and at this current point, you were at their headquarters. That's where they, yeah. they'd taken you right. Yeah. And it just happened to be yeah. just around the corner from where you're, headquarters was with the battalion that you've been working. so basically the headquarters was 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 here where i was in um you know captured you turn around one two three it was a little square and on the other side of the square there was the headquarters of the other battalion that i was with so my fix the first thing it does is just like goes oh okay oh i'm here runs runs to that place and uh tells everyone about it and uh i'd say half an hour later because there's a lot of people that came down half an hour later he's shouting and i hear some uh gunfire outside and i'm like "Hmm, okay that's 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 good you know any anything other than complete silence is good (laughs) it's good news and um and then I hear just like this for half an hour, I hear back and forth, you know, soldiers coming in and people talking and people talking on the phone. Da, 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 da. And obviously then I realized that, you know, the people there that were detaining me called the big guy and the big guy said, well, okay, release them. Obviously we're outgunned. And then, um, but they did not release both of us at the same time. Really. They released first me because I was not the one that took photos of them. So I was seen as less culpable. The other guy, um, you know, there was this whole thing about him having to pay a fine for having this debate because at this point, in a way, in front of, of the other battalion, they could not play the guys that were like actual criminals trying to sell us off. They had to play, you know, the normal Free Syrian Army Battalion that had just, you know, um, caught two potential, uh, you know, uh, spies and, you know, had yeah. to punish them. So there's this whole thing of like, he has to pay a fine because he took photos without permission. And, you know, in reality, they were holding hostage his material, you know, his equipment in order to get money from him. And, um, so basically they 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 took him to his place where he got some money, I think three hundred dollars and had to pay his way out. Right. So I never actually saw this guy ever again, this other journalist. Wow. Lucky for him, Do you have any I idea? <laughs> I have no idea about his name. His fixer was killed, I think, six months later. So I don't even oh, wow. I'm not even able to talk to him. All I know is my fixer, the one that I was with, he's still alive. He'd been, in the meantime, between back then and now, he had been uh, recaptured by ISIS this time and held hostage and tortured for about nine months to a year um, uh, for being a non-Islamist. So, I mean, he's someone that, I mean, sometimes we write to each other and go, do you remember that story but like for me it's like do you remember but it's like for him it's just like yeah i do remember but you know compared to six months being tortured it's probably not not a lot but wow you know for me it was the craziest thing and like he you know he laughs and just says ah if you just knew what i had to suffer after that and i'm like god yeah i bet i bet you did I guess uh, that's know, the got... comparison of, um, you know, the criminal g- gang working for Assad and their attitude towards the fixers, which was just, these are just yeah. dudes making a buck like we are, as opposed to a, a religious zealot group like ISIS who yeah. found that fixer and ended up torturing him and kidnapping him for, because yeah. he wasn't sticking by, you know, God's holy Absolutely. way. Well, I mean, let's, Let's be completely honest here. I mean, ISIS is a money-making machine. I mean, for them, it's all business, but it's an infusion. It's like Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is essentially an infusion of uh, Wahhabi, uh, super conservative, violent, um, 
they say traditional, but I don't really buy into that. I'd say it's archaic and and really inhuman, but it's super business driven as well. I mean, they are all about money. It's you know everything they do. They had you know they would steal uh, you know ancient you know um, pottery and and sort of you know uh, stuff that could be sold on the international market to uh, you know some collectors. Uh, they would uh, look at the you know they would steal and sell um, petrol and gas to Turkey. They smuggle drugs uh, between countries. I mean, so in a sense, sure, they have all these like rules and regulations, but at the end of the day, if they can completely, uh, you know, fuck those up for the sake of money, well, they'll do that. Mm. You know, so, so, so they're completely, um, how can I say, you know, sure, these are ideals and everything, but you know, can we make a bag, buck out of it? Yes. Okay. Well, then you know, brush it, it is. It is amazing right. how how quickly once people have have power at stake, how quickly their their ideals and their morals can twist and contort to help keep them in power or give them more power, and yet they'll they'll really hold other people below them to account and make them accountable if yeah, they absolutely. if they dare to sway from the from the path that they believe is righteous 100 um, percent. i mean i mean the, control, the right? a, a, a lot of the a lot of the heads of isis had uh tvs had you know prostitutes i mean basically women that they would take from the uh, from the battlefield and for and rape them mm. but you know in order to not rape them they would marry them at 8 p.m rape them and then unmarry them at 10 p.m so like you see how this whole like rule and regulation was just completely tailored to the completely stupid uh, ideology i mean no so, so i shouldn't say stupid because one needs to understand it in order to uh you know to fight it uh you know i don't want to belittle it because unfortunately this has caused uh, huge grief for millions of people around the world and you know um you know a, a lot a lot of this ideology has been paid fostered uh, spurred by western political and economic attitudes so you know I, I i i'm far from saying this is just like some middle eastern uh, invention uh, uh, that goes against our free and democratic morals of the West. Not at all. I mean, the West is really good at preaching democracy at home and then, you know, dictatorships abroad or even dictatorships, you know, in our own home when it suits us, mm -hmm. um, i.e. look at how we behave with minorities. So, you know, far from trying to belittle it, but it is once you see how contradictory and how two-faced and double standard it is it is quite disgusting i think well i think that's and, the thing you know as a whole you can always step back and look at something as a whole and and the way and the belief system that people profess about their whole structure and you can see the ideals within that that they profess as being really um morally sound or or they might you know they might come from a point of view that really does sound like they're they're being quite righteous and they have a solid belief system but but yeah when you break it down and you go individualistic and you notice within that system all these people yeah. being completely hypocritical and going against what they even say on stage and behind closed doors they're doing things that they just for their own self-gratification that's when you just yeah. go this is just it just completely crumbles and and um yeah. And it takes away any respect for the for the larger piece, right? The larger absolutely, order. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and and you know, it's like there is uh, a lot of uh, hypocritical behaviors uh, be behavior on both sides of the aisle. We must not forget that. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, the more extreme that behavior is, 
and the more hypocritical that person is, the 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 harder it is to accept. You yeah. Know? You you ask from mm. women and poor people a certain kind of extremely pious behavior, and then you turn around. Uh, rape people, snort drugs, and get into all sort of you know illegal activity in order to forward your agenda. Well, you know that doesn't sit well with me. You know? mm. um, so yeah, by the end of it, uh, you know I was freed, and uh, I went back to Do you, the would, Katiba. And, yeah. Sorry, would you say that 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 um, would you say? I mean, there's so many so many moments in that whole story where like. You know, sliding door after sliding door. You know, moments where anything could go any way. Yeah. Would you would you say that a major moment of you being rescued really came down to the fact that they let the fixers go, and you just happened to be so close to the battalion, so that your fixer could run to your battalion and w- tell them and gather sure. them up and get them back to to pull you out. Like without that, one hundred percent. Oh, man. that's just well wild. i mean i mean that's just it was it, it was quite strange for me uh that they allowed the fixes to go before they could then take us to a second location it was um and i think that those were still the early days like most of the other people that were kidnapped were kidnapped uh, in february march uh in april and may of 2013 so i think that those were kind of like the early days of kidnapping so you know a lot of the protocols had not been you know looked at the you know a lot of these groups had not really um kind of pieced it all together they didn't realize they hadn't stripped well, but, but by a certain, but by, 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 you know, early 2013, there was a streamlining of like, even, even um, Syrians were being kidnapped. You know, there was just a, like, you'd get in and it was like black hole. You know, I mass, did end up going back market. again. Wow. I mean, it's that, that was not my last time in Syria by, by a long shot. I mean, I had a l- two or three other close calls. And by the last close call, I was like, no, it's uh, you know when you're like surfing and you look at the you know the water and it's go it's a bit sharky, right? It's it's overcast, sharky out there. Kind of like you know a few <laughs> waves, there's not many, and you're just kind of like with your eyes, you can kind of see the two fins just like coming up. And you're like sharky, you better get out. <laughs> and it's just like that. That was the same feeling. It was like mm, serious becoming a bit uh, kidnappy, just you know, <laughs> just a little bit kidnappy, just like. Kidnappy here, kidnappy there. When's the it going to be my turn? These days. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. It's just uh, it's got a bit of a you know kidnappy feeling around. So slowly but surely, we just like I think none of it. I do remember. You know, um, I don't want to say the name of the person because you know just in case they, they, you know, someone that knows them listens and sure, I will sure, want yeah. to you know repeat that pain but uh three months later a colleague of mine called me I was in Istanbul at the time and um he just said hey Patrick uh, have you worked with this fixer and I was like uh yeah yeah I, I have uh oh, what do you think about him and I'm like look uh I would say don't work with him because that's the he fixer has that a- the, the, the other guy had no, no, no. It's it's a third one. It's oh, another it's one a, again. It's a separate one together. Okay. Yeah. Another one. Yeah, yeah. We often sort of had four or five at, at a time because, you know, they all had different access to different groups, and, sure. you know, based on the story. So this one guy, he would drive this massive sort of four-wheel pickup truck that was just so distinctive and and and... It was just obvious. It was just like I'm assuming is a vaccine. I'm just assuming you don't want anything that's obvious in a situation like that. No. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, the last time I went out of Syria, I basically was so uh, wary about you know anything that I got a taxi, a big van taxi, to basically. Um, Basically, I, I had a lot of people put bags with clothes and everything that 
you know, it looked like it was some because there were a lot of refugees that were going from Aleppo out to Turkey because of the fear of war. And I just, and, and you know, so I got all these people and all this stuff in, in this van that looked like it was full. And I lied underneath the, the chairs for the whole trip because I was mm. so nervous about being recognized. So, wow. you know, you can imagine, um, you know, what, what what driving in a car with an obvious, uh, you know, fixer would do to you. And I was like, and he explained to me some of the, you no, know, he explained to me that he'd already postponed by two days going into Syria because he had heard from a third party that someone was tracking this fixer. But this fixer, had in turn assured him that that was not true, that it was taking all the precautions and that he, were, he was mm. safe. And I was like, and he had a very big assignment from big magazine and he was a freelancer. So, you know, uh, big assignments are like a carrot for a freelancer. They're like, oh, you know, big assignment, you know? So I would say, I said to him, just do not do it. I mean, it's too dangerous. People have been kidnapped left, right and center. This guy's obviously on the radar. Well, don't do it. And he was like, okay, thanks. Thanks for your, you know, for your input. Uh, 24 hours later, he walked across the border, got into this fixed car, and 60 minutes later was stopped by uh, 15 armed men. Um, it was kidnapped along with the fixer. It was released a few days later. And uh, next time we saw him was um, on a video being uh, murdered oh, in front yeah. of uh, a camera. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I, I still feel extremely guilty for not having pressed my point. Harder. Sounds like you uh, did press a point, though. I mean, that's you know, that's making it pretty clear that you didn't believe you should follow through with it. Tell yeah, but you know, as journalists, we we come so close so often to things like that that there's that sense of invincibility, which is a scary feeling. Like you start thinking, you know, hasn't happened, mm. never happened, you know might just never happen and that's that's a real dangerous point to get to and i think a lot of journalists have been doing this for for a bit get that feeling sooner or later and that's exactly when you need to stop doing it for a while and reconsider because that's yeah. when you're gonna step a little bit over and you're gonna get into a lot of trouble yeah i imagine um, that's a um i mean i don't know how real realistic a lot of these movies are but i watched a movie called the bang bang club <clears throat> a little while ago yeah. about um you're probably familiar with it about those yeah yeah, yeah 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 about the war photographers and um and just watching them south africa descend into that state of like mm. i'm behind a camera so i'm just sort of invincible as i sort of bounce yeah. around these men with machetes who are wildly swinging them at each other and yeah, I mean, it's taking on the. You can see that the attitude develops that that well. I'm not really here, so I'm not really going to get harmed. Yeah. I haven't been harmed to to, to this point, and yeah. the shot is so important. Like the shot is just the absolute be all and end all of what I want to achieve. Yeah. And if I don't get that shot, and I've been in this situation that's so extreme, and I don't get the shot, well, where's the proof that I was ever in the situation? And if I'm going to risk my life to be in the situation, well, I want the proof that I was that I risked my life. So I imagine that's a real tough decision for you guys to like mm -hmm. have all of that going through your head. I mean, to 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 walk away without the footage must be a really also yeah must put you on the edge of taking major risks. Well, there's a, I, I thought a, a lot about what makes us tick. And, and it's a real mixed bag of uh, thought, feelings. It's a mix of uh, gut reaction. I mean, there's some people that uh, are curious about how extreme the world of conflict is. I was always... Uh, I suppose somewhat attracted to 
how life and death co- coexist and and really mm, how mm, humans can do such extreme actions to each other you know like what what what's the psychology behind it why do people resort to doing the most unfathomable of things uh to perhaps you know civilians that are just completely vulnerable and um and then there's an element of uh, of invincibility you know but but by going to war i become invincible i i become stronger than the life and death itself then there's an element of uh, career you know i want to have a career and this is a fast track for uh for a career at a moment where photojournalism is in huge crisis because you know there's very little money into print magazines because advertising is mostly digital and therefore print media doesn't get as much money therefore doesn't pay as much therefore there's not enough jobs therefore the competition is very fierce therefore i need to be the top dog in order just to you know pull through and survive um and then there's another element of like you know young ego that wants to defeat death uh wants to see who they will be faced with the ultimate consequences um and then there's another element of witnessing history i mean a lot of these situations have defined societies for decades to be you know we still remember the second world war we still remember the first world war we still remember god oh, the i don't know the wars before that and and i was in syria you know everyone knows what the war in syria is and has been um and i was there i saw it with my own eyes i saw it develop and there's a feeling of being in the in the driving seat of history which is uh, quite exhilarating and uh, it makes you feel like you're living life at the fullest um that has huge risks and consequences uh in terms of your own personal mental well-being also physical um sometimes on such, a, on such a long-term level you know like i don't want to go right into you know try and unpack your whole <laughs> history of of um of your stability through all this but like i i just it must be such a long term thing because every step of the way through a through a career like this it's just a small building block into in terms of the long a long line of built up ptsd mm. or or inability to express things or or shutting certain parts of yourself down over and over and over again and developing patterns that you just that you must yeah. find it harder and harder to go back and and change um so I, yeah. well mostly mostly because um in order to survive on the field you need to have certain behaviors and certain instincts which are not do not necessarily serve you in in normal civil society such as shutting parts of you down in order to get through a certain dangerous moment uh might not be the best way of um approaching a love relationship <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you feel like in front of you there's someone that's about to hurt you uh your partner because you know let's face it in normal relationships you love and you hurt each other uh quite often without meaning to but you might feel at a certain point that your partner could hurt you and you shut completely down emotionally to get mm. through that moment and whilst that is very useful if not essential uh, in war that's definitely not essential in a relationship and actually can bring uh the relationship to a breakdown so you need to you need to really be able to to switch that element in your head uh from civilian to to conflict and that's something that a lot of soldiers complain about i have to say that you know the added trauma of of a of a soldier is the fact that they take a life mm. we do not do that and that's i think a massive 
difference. You know, I feel like I go to these places for a reason that helps and furthers the interests uh, of humanity as a whole and of dialogue between countries, populations and people. At least good journalism should. Uh, I don't go there to kill people. I don't go there to terminate people's lives. Mm. I'm not. I'm not judging what a soldier does, but there are some differences when it comes to PTSD, um, where I am just a witness. They are a witness and a major actor within it. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it's not you know not for any level of judgment it's just simply they're in the situation I mean, that, that 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 is what they're there to do so yeah, yeah i mean to, you know where and whether they're there to do it or not like having to do that like i'm sure when they go back and they're in a safe situation their reflection on taking that life isn't completely cushioned by the fact that they had to do it and that they were, had authority to do it. I'm sure that the the very fact that they took a life still completely plagues their mind. And just... sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. I just, sorry, just... Uh, c- c- did I cut out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just that, like whether or not you know whether or not they had the authority to take that life or not, and whether they were in a position mm-hmm. where they had to due to due to you know um higher powers telling them they should because they're a soldier in a war yeah. that that doesn't cushion the pain and the impact of having taken the life once they're out of that situation and they're reflecting on it absolutely like they're still going to go through the trauma of of what that meant and and whether they should have and all that kind of stuff all those questions are going to plague their mind well i mean what what mm-hmm. what i think really does um fuck with soldiers' minds is that they uh, have to take extreme decisions uh, without being able to assess the situation critically because they are basically uh, doing what they're told. Mm. And I think that that, to some extent, takes away personal responsibility Mm. because it makes them think, well, I had to. You know, it's that sort of Nazi syndrome, you know, Oh, you know, I took everything to gas chambers, but everyone to the gas chambers, but you know, I was told to, so I had to do it. You know, so it de- uh, takes away responsibility from 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 people. Uh, but really, I think once they dig within themselves in the silence of the post-war situation, they realize that they have taken extreme action without any critical thinking. Yeah, sure, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure that's and the it. wars can only be fought like that. Mm. Yeah, there just must be. I mean, on every level, there there must be so much that it that guys like you in your position and anyone within a war situation, once they're in a safe zone, there just must be such an incredible amount to have to go through. I I just uh, I was just interviewing a mate um, who's uh yeah ex-military guy security specialist who's looked after the security and safety of humanitarian um, agencies getting food into into places like somalia and he was in mogadishu through um through some major conflict there and and uh yeah just like he would when he would uh when i would meet him in bali between between his you know his work sessions in these extreme conflict zones like we we'd just we'd want he'd want a party to get his head away from that place but in the first hour or so of sort of getting ready and you know getting all hyped up and getting all the drinks together and about we're going to go out to a nightclub or whatever he would be like all right i need to go and defrag the hard drive for a moment and he would go off into a room and he'd spend as long as it took like usually about half an hour like minimum and he just needs to be in there on his own in a dark room just defragging what he'd seen and what he'd been through before he could go out and just Mm. cut loose so yeah i I just i imagine for all of you in any situation like that like whether it's photojournalism or or um being in a security sector like he was or especially being like you said a soldier that actually takes a life like to be back in that reflective safe space you've just got so much to process it's insane 
Well, yes, but um, the problem the, the problem with uh, you know the difference between journalists and soldiers and and members of the private sector is that quite often those guys have uh, serious uh, um, uh, resources behind them. So they have you know psychologists that are paid mm -hmm. by the government or by the private sector. They have uh, constant training to you know face these kind of situations they have we are working mostly on a shoestring i mean yeah, wow. there's that's a big a, difference a big between point, yeah, um, freelance life yeah i mean freelancers essentially they just need to come out with the material uh you know a media says oh perhaps they are on assignment like i was so they get paid by the day or otherwise they get paid by, for the story but they're not getting time off, paid time off. They're not getting, you know, psychological support. Uh, you know, um, quite often, even in a dangerous area, the um, the editor will not say, "Oh, you know, are you okay?" They just go, "Do you have that image? Do you have that? What's that? What's this?" You know, there's no. I mean, with with this magazine, uh, some magazines are very uh are very supportive and they're very like okay are you okay you know do you need help no no no. i'm not i'm not saying the whole industry as a whole is like that but i would say that probably 80 percent are much more interested in the material that you have the the deadline by when by what you know how much you know da, 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 uh 20 percent might actually think okay maybe i should check in a little bit deeper yeah. a little bit more yeah. so and that and that means a lot you know that there are some organizations uh like the dart center for trauma uh that you know do free uh seminars for people for uh, freelancers you know and i've I'm, I'm actually due to do one next month uh you know that there are some sort of centers and and organization that do help us but you know you're talking about two or three with uh, extremely limited funds you know compared yeah, to well, a large organization i guess it really just comes um, down to having to seek it out yourself which is um pretty big responsibility well i mean what i'm saying is like you know <laughs> you know how many of my colleagues go to war zone and instead of being worried about the next bomb on the next bullet they're worried about whether they're getting paid or they're going to go back home having made a buck or mm -hmm. having done everything of this for free you know how many young freelancers came to see a risk in their lives and they actually lost money <laughs> it's insane wow. yeah it's insane so not only have they got you know the trauma and everything but they've got debts on they top of come it. out with anything oh man that's just devastating no. isn't it it's just full on wow yeah so well, i mean well, yeah. yeah well man I, I think we'll start winding up but um yeah one 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 thing I just wanted to quickly ask just in relation to the story was the battalion, just that part about the battalion you were working with. Yeah. What does, what does that mean that you were embedded within a, with a battalion? You, you, you had made friends with them and sort of made contact with them and they were allowing you to sort of work. So basically, with them to get uh, footage. So basically my writer, the writer was working with uh, for the German magazine he had found a uh, German Syrian fighter in uh, like working for the with the free, fighting for the Free Syrian Army, and this guy had lived, I think, most of his life was was a son of uh, Syrian immigrants. So he spent his whole life in in Germany, you know, full German, you know, just done all the schooling, everything, but was also a proud Syrian that wanted to fight for his country. So wow we kind of did a story on how um on how this young german guy ended up you know shooting to you know syrian soldiers on the front lines after having done an it job in munich wow what an weird. incredible story so that was literally his battalion that was three streets away from yeah. where you were being held hostage yeah. oh my yeah. god dude what an incredible story man thanks for sharing it that was um that's uh it's incredible to hear it, it really it's it's mind-blowing no worries I really well to be honest it, it i i did really enjoy it because some of the details that we spoke about i had not thought about 
since then because you know when you tell a story usually don't tell it in this detail mm. and to be honest i don't really tell any of these stories to anyone just because a lot of the time it sounds like either you're trying to puff your chest by saying oh i've been in danger or uh you, people just tend to stay quiet because they don't know what to say because it's so far removed from yeah you know it's interesting like, like okay it's interesting so, so it's really like you feel so weird about sharing these things and with with other journalists you sound like an old fart just like reminiscing about old times and how dangerous mm. life is to you know you don't want to say that to your parents or to people that love you because you're gonna freak them out you don't say that to strangers because they you don't know how they're going to react and sometimes they're going oh who's this weirdo and if you tell it to a big crowd it sounds like you're puffing your chest out so there's very few yeah, avenues where these kind of stories can come out it's funny everyone just why I'm... it's so great that you've got this channel and yeah. because a well, lot that's... of these people that you're talking to are not people that are willing usually to share these stories with other people. It's a big, it's a big factor. It's everyone that I've been talking to, um, like the guy that running the security co uh, um, operations in Somalia, um, him and, and all, you know, I, I know, as you know, I know him and a lot of, um, a lot of crew all through the same people and through the same contacts and all that kind of stuff. And they've all, since I've started this channel and, and been contacting them and asking them if they'd like to share stories, they've all said the exact same thing that you just said, which is, you know, a lot of them have, have also gone on into the corporate sector now and they're, they're running security risk management in, in the more corporate sector. And they're absolutely not comfortable telling these stories anymore to, to those people that they work with now for that, that reason that one, it sounds, you know, they might feel silly like they're puffing their chest to yeah. the people that they're that they're telling the story to either won't believe them or will then even question their mental health because should they really exactly. be working should they should be exactly. they, should this guy be working with them if they if they've been through these unstable environments so yeah they they've all said it's um they feel like a lot of these stories not only do they not get the chance to tell them but the stories are being lost and just disappearing into the yeah. back of their minds and and they're actually quite happy to tell me the stories to sort of get them out they get to verbalize it again as a means of release and they get to keep it it, it gets documented so yeah i really appreciate well, it can I, i'm glad you can, felt comfortable can i me. can i just get, get, can i just give you a very quick example of a story that was lost i just the other day i was talking to a colleague of mine that i went to mosul for the fall of isis with and uh she said do you remember that time that we hired a car we tried to go to Mosul together because we didn't have a lot of money and then we didn't use a fix and I was like didn't remember I totally forgot about it and then I remember I was like oh yeah <laughs> what happened is that we rented a car in Kurdistan and drove through all the checkpoints and everything into Mosul I the GPS the Google Maps wasn't working so we tried to go a little bit like that and then we ended up on a street and at the very end of the street, I see these ISIS flags. And I'm like, I look at them, I'm like, oh my God. fuck. And we just realized we've gone Into instead of like ISIS with the territory. Well, towards it. And I was like, <laughs> okay, this is probably not a good idea. And like all oh, the man. buildings were like going from normal to like more. Bomb, 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 bomb. So we just like very gradually, just like that, just like that, and just like warm out. Regret these. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, that's a weird thing not to remember. Probably oh. if anyone else had lived through something like that, they would be fucking. Anyway, plenty oh, of stories, it's, it's... and can't wait to see your your new stories on your channel. Yeah, man, well, love let's, it. Let's let's do this again. I mean, if you, I imagine there's a there's years of stories that you've got stacked up, so I'd love to hear more. So let's uh, let's do it again and nail some more out. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Cool, man. Great chatting to you. Okay. okay. All right. Have a good Ciao. one.